Hello, I'm Logan Phillips and welcome to my vlog, or as we like to call it, The Vlogan. This is a vlog dedicated to people with special needs and those who love them. Welcome viewers, uh, listeners to the special needs planning podcast and video cast. Today, I am honored and lucky to have Director Davis come and speak with me and you all to tell us a little bit about his role and the role of the Department of Developmental Disabilities in the world of special needs planning. Uh, Director Davis, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And quite frankly, how easy it was to get to you. It's a, it's a true testament to your accessibility. There's not too many government agencies where you can call up and the director says, sure, I'd like to be out there because I want to get out there and, and have people know what we do. So thanks so much for being here. Being a little kind. So thank you for that. You know, uh, I miss it. I traveled anywhere anybody would invite me in calendar year 19, right? Wherever. I'd love to be with you. Of course, uh, last year was a little bit of a sea change. Yeah. So can you just tell the viewers a little bit about how you became the director, a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into what the department does. Sure. I don't know how exciting it is, but we'll, we'll do that. So I was fortunate enough. I actually, back in the 80s, worked at the Ohio Senate and with the Ohio Senate right downtown in the state house, and, and was the legislative aide. And when Governor Voinovich came in, you know, they, with the, it was changing parties. So, you, you know, you change some things around. The new director coming in, Director Jerry Manuel, was looking for a legislative liaison and had a good friend of mine say you should go over and, and talk to them. I mean, you know, it was just, it's just how people are kind and, and, you know, friends look out for one another and different things. And it was just a nice, immediate interaction. You know, so it's just one of my lucky days. Actually, whether it's good for the system or not, the anniversary was April 1st. If you get that, that's when I started. So, so and, and what did you do immediately beforehand? Because that's where you and I actually met when you were working at Opera or working directing at right. Opera. So I spent 16 years with the department and then the very same thing happened, right? I mean, you had a new governor coming in, different party, new director. You want the people around you that you feel most comfortable with. That makes the most sense. Uh, I understood that. And so for a period of about four years, I was fortunate enough to work with a Medicaid managed care company, Buckeye, you know, one of our managed care companies that was worked with, uh, particularly with, with the mental health system, managed care hospitals to try and see what this was before sort of mandated integration. I was trying to get people to think about mm -hmm. commonality and, and working together. It was very interesting. And so lucky for that. And then opera, Mark Davis was the executive director, called me in to see if I wanted to come back home, you know, to our system, which is exactly, mm -hmm. how felt. you know, yeah, I miss, I miss those that we support. I miss our system. I miss my friends. And so that was not a hard choice. Will you tell the viewers what OPERA stands for? OPERA stands for the Ohio Provider Resource Association. So it represents private providers. It's a member association, a trade organization uh, that has been around a long, long time in our system. It's, it's specific to our system. So they are, you know, it is, is DD providers uh, across the board. So it was, again, it was just good luck on my part and enjoyable and worthwhile. Yeah. You know, that, that sort of helped, you know, that journey probably helped in getting me where I am, you know, diversity of experience doesn't hurt. And so opera is really about helping providers provide the best care that they can for individuals who need those supports. Will you tell the viewers about the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, kind of generally what the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities does, and then how people see the work of the department in their day-to-day -day lives. You bet. So in Ohio, I always felt that we were fortunate that we have a single state agency devoted to this level of supports, right? And so we are not a division with an overall, you know, within a, a bigger department, let's say Medicaid or whatever it might be, or a, you know, a combination. This department used to be, you know, with a sort of combined department of mental health and developmental disabilities. It split off, I think, in the, in the 80s. So again, the fact that Ohio recognizes that there is a uniqueness to our supports, that there is the imperative nature of it, the essential function, I say that's absolutely fantastic. And what it does yeah. is, is allow us to you know, focus our energies collectively, holistically, you know, uh, and then devote that kind of energy and be a cabinet level agency right under the governor. I think it has proven itself in Ohio. Uh, not certainly not just from a resource standpoint, but from a, an ability to prioritize our services and you know be right there and make you know make decisions 
accordingly, really. Yeah. Uh, with that respect, we're very fortunate now under that then, and I'll just, don't mean to, you know, we'll follow up, is that it, it, you know, what does the department do? Well, it does the basics. You pay, right? I mean, we, you know, you pay provide. Yep service uh i mean that's critical you have to do all the things you set you know whatever one thinks of rules and regulations you have to have some structure to a system so you know is the department's uh you know uh within the parameters of the department to set set the tone and set regulation um and then do the things that uh, one might do to help and assist in the implementation of that and of course you know along with that comes you know after the fact which are uh, reviews, compliance. I mean, you have to hold uh, our system to some level of integrity. You have to hold the individual parts to some level and integrity and fidelity to the rules and regulations. And so we have that function too, but there are a number of different pieces to that puzzle. So the big, uh, you know, everyone talks about waivers in the disability community. Uh, and so um, the, the department administers those waivers, correct? Designs them and, and, and helps with their implementation. Is that right? That's a, that's absolutely correct. So you design them, you pay for them, and then you, yeah. and then you're, you basically hold the system accountable. But we are broader, aren't we? I mean, that's yeah. the key. So, you know, and I I give uh, you know my predecessor, I told him this, Director Martin, a lot of credit because he he actually took steps to, you know, bring back some of the functions into this very department. So you think about early intervention that was over with the Department of Health. You think about our intermediate care facility program that was with Medicaid, you know, and took steps to bring that in so that we are really, you know, all of us together. It's not just my position or the department, all of us together now are really, you know, uh, sort of, you know, within, within the scope of the department. I think that's massive. And when we talk about waivers, I mean, you, you, it, of course that's true, but I, you never want to forget all of the pieces to the puzzle that our system offers. You know, enormous effort has gone into to improving that program statewide, bringing more consistency, bringing more funding into that program. I mean, that is working. Right. That's fantastic. Of course, then you go into, into school age and some of the things that we do, multi-system youth, that kind of thing, of course, into the waiver system. And of course, our intermediate care facilities. And of course, we still have developmental centers, you know, for those that that the system doesn't yet have capacity for those individuals, perhaps, where there's not capacity out there to serve in one way or another. Yeah, it, you know, I, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, intermediate care facilities. I think that some people get uh, the wrong idea about intermediate care facilities and, and, and don't really understand that how small and individualized a person's care can be mm-hmm. in an inter- intermediate care facility. I think that people think when they hear intermediate care facility, they think large, they think uh, non-individualized care. And um, my experience has been that's not at all the case. Tremendous, tremendous care and warmth and, and, and love goes into helping those individuals in intermediate care facilities. And some of them are very, very small. Very, very small. Yeah. You just hit on it, right? I mean, I think we're all aware, and I've been, been part of sort of a philosophically driven system as we've moved over the years, you know, in the last 50 years and different things. Yeah. And I understand, uh, I understand all of that. I'm probably, you know, one that, you know, what works for someone at that moment in time, if this system can offer that. That's great. Now, can you tell the viewers the interaction between the state department level that you're working at and the local county boards? What's that interaction? That is the partnership that you've got to have. So one other way in which, you know, we can consider ourselves fortunate, I think, in Ohio is that we have a local governmental arm in each county, right? That is that hands-on service and support administrator. It's that SSA function in our system. And when we do that really well, that that really is that continual link in nurturing and support, working with, you know, individuals, families, uh, and and how we make our system work. So over the years, we have continually sort of redefined that relationship a lot more authority, so to speak. We've given to counties in some respects with respect to Medicaid, as we've invested more heavily, you know, into Medicaid over the years. Mm-hmm. But that's how I think of it: is it that you know where we're really good you know, we have that local touch. And of course, we're always looking to be more consistent where consistency is appropriate. We're always trying to work on our culture to make sure all of us on our culture to make sure that we are kind, right? And that we are capable. So, so your department 
coordinates and provides the funding and all of that for the training for the SSAs and all, well, all of that. Do that. I, I, okay. I, counties do that in large measure right now. Okay. And I should say that the other advantage that Ohio has with our county structure, of course, it's not the only one, but it certainly is true that they are able to raise local dollars mm -hmm. you know, tax levies through property tax levies. And you can't, you can't discount that. I never like to lead with that um, because it's not always about money, but that, uh, you know, that ability, which other states do not have to raise money locally has been essential to, you know, increasing the numbers of people supported and the kinds of supports. Yeah. Now, I, I know that you don't like to um, talk about the stuff that you are personally doing because uh, you don't like to toot your own horn. So I'm going to toot it a little bit. Can you tell uh, the viewers a little bit about the budget process and, and the role of your department? And I'm, I'm familiar with how much the advocacy the department does um, related to the budget, even just the last budget cycle. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I certainly will. And we'll just talk in general uh, on that. So thank you uh, for that. So, I mean, look, the, every two years uh, in Ohio, the state goes through its budget process. So they have a two-year budget. And that really is the signature. That's the bill in every legislature that probably matters the most, because that is what the governor's office and then in concert with the legislature and, of course, all of the massive advocacy efforts across everything in Ohio. You know, that's the statement. This is what we prioritize. This is what we believe in. So that's how you think of a budget. Mm -hmm. This is what we're saying that we prioritize and you, prior you know, prioritize it by putting money behind it. And yeah. so the, it's a massive effort. Uh, and every agency goes through the same thing. Our system, I think, has been lucky over the years. Um, fortunate in the fact that because it's done it itself is there is just tremendous advocacy in our system. And I've seen that, you know, for 30 years and our advocacy in many ways is stronger than other systems when it wants to be right. Whether it's, whether it's negative in cases where there are things that they really want or, or, you know, oftentimes reinforcing. So what the budget process starts out with the governor. I mean, it's, it's repeats itself every two years. So it's pretty sad. Mm -hmm far as the structure goes, you set out, you've got your budget from the current where you are, depending on the economic climate, there might be more money available. Uh, you know, it coming out of COVID, it's a little tighter, obviously. Mm -hmm. context, but then the governor and his team through the Office of Budget Management set the parameters, you know, for each agency, they generally similar parameters, but you've got to make your case, you know, as an as a cabinet director, you know, as to what your system needs. And that's really where it starts. And so it starts in the summer. So it started last summer. Um, and then, okay, this is what we built on. This is where we want to go. These are the priorities that we have and within the economic climate. Uh, and it turns over to the legislature and then, hey, the whole world weighs in, right? And uh, that's where our system oftentimes is quite remarkable. And so in this year, you know, we had a little tough in, in, in COVID, the economy, there was uncertainty, we know, and anxiety around the economy. And so uh, there wasn't really a lot of money to be spent. Uh, I'm saying this one that we're in, right, this, this budget period that we're in uh, with the legislature now looking yeah. into you know, July 1 of this year and then July 1 of next year. Uh, but the current biennium that we're in two years ago in 19 really was, you know, one of those uh, you felt like all the stars aligned, you know, for us, very strong advocacy. We had a, had a, you know, an advocacy in our system where people were in sync. That was always, that was pretty positive. We needed to get money into, you know, into direct support staff, DSPs. We needed to, we wanted to focus on early intervention. The governor was real clear in his priorities from back in January of 19, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on children. So we fit in that nicely with early intervention and with multi-system youth. And then, you know, my opinion, uh, but I believe with all my heart, the governor has, has been so receptive to us and what we've asked for. And, you know, we were able because, and we had a favorable economic climate. You can never discount that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know, I know the DSP was what um, a lot of my clients and the viewers were, were very interested in. So, um, 
you know, as you know, m- many of my clients are parents of children with disabilities and, you know, the direct service provider and, and that you said money behind it. And I'm going to put it in, in, uh, in, in specific terms, the hourly rate for those people. Um, and I know that the department under your leadership was, was huge in getting that increase that, that wouldn't have happened. Well, again, the, you know, I always, you, you start with the, the governor and his team, don't you? And then you, you know, um, I mean, the workforce is, you know, of all the things that we're trying to do, there's no question. I mean, all of the, we're going to be very aggressive uh, in, in trying to make our system better in any number of different ways. But on the ground, the workforce, you know, that the, the availability of DSP as you hope quality people uh, that come into that, that, that hangs over everything. We know that, mm-hmm. you know, your system, you know, is as good as, uh, in some measure, at least, right, on, on what the supports are on the ground. So you had to get money into the pockets of, of our direct support professionals. We had to. So the governor, again, our county board stepped up, if you remember, back in 19 and committed some of their local levy dollars. Mm-hmm. As well. So we set it on, on a good path, I think, with the budget as introduced. And then, you know, there was some good relationships uh, with legislators and, you know, a a few in particular that really mattered. I mean, that's where I just think that things aligned, you know, with the giant step after the bill was introduced, which is not always the case. It was just good. And and, um, it it points to, I mean, it does point to um, people working together and relationships are meaningful. The goal of of this video cast and uh, video podcast was to kind of demonstrate to my viewers and help them exp- help them get a better understanding of how what may seem its big department really kind of works and funnels down to their day to day, and that the, you know the department is directly responsible for that person who knocks on the door and is going to give respite care for for a family or uh, you know offer um, offer you know personal care to their loved one, and, um, you know. It's really, really important. So I'm so glad that you were able to, to talk a little bit about that. It's a journey, isn't it? It's always a journey. Oh yeah, yeah. Not yeah. Like we had a record, you know, you know, even after the really good budgets of, of Director Martin, some of them, we, you know, we were still able to get more money into our system in a two-year budget than we ever were, thanks to so many people. But, you know, I never forget ever, ever that that it's you can. And this is no criticism to anybody, but I say it, you know, enough that we can all can always be better, always, always, always be better at everything you're doing. And our yeah. system, certainly, you know, as the professional part of our system, you know, you just you just have to you have to work at it. Um, you concentrate on your fundamentals, you know, but then and then get better. Yeah, great. So I'd like to close with what um, is a is, is a very, very meaningful um, concern and of interest, particularly to um, my viewers, um, and that's residential options. You know, we talk about um, many of my clients are, are getting older. Um, they're, they're seeing that their, uh, their individual is no longer a 14-year-old boy, he's a 24-year-old man, and they're, they're interested in residential options. Can you just talk a little bit about the role of the department in residential options, um, because I know that there's some confusion um, about what waivers pay for and don't pay for. I'm sometimes I I feel like I give the bad news that a waiver doesn't cover residential options, but I always say the waiver oftentimes is the reason that you can have your uh, loved one uh, live in their own place because of the waiver services, but the waiver doesn't cover that residential. Can you just talk briefly about that? But so housing is a component. We know that. Well, you know, let's start with, you know, where we started, which is there is, there is a sort of um, continuum sometimes is not always the word in favor, but there is a, you know, a variety of services that one can do in one's own home. The waiver can help support staff to come in, you know, outside the home, the waiver supports staff. And then you figure out what that living arrangement looks like. How do you arrange housing? What does that housing look like? Where does technology fit in as we increasingly get better and better in technology? The waiver pays for pieces of that. We have some other funding streams that help, you know, with the roof over your head and the number of different things like that. 
but it is putting that puzzle together. It is unique enough to the individual. You know, that's the ideal that mm -hmm. is up to the individual. Now, there is, there is no, no system that exists on planet Earth, and I can't imagine there will be where everybody has everything that they want. You know, let's say that we had every person that we supported wanted to live by themselves. Um, you know, absent some miracle, the this, this system can't, it just can't do those things. It can get you, you know, perhaps part of what you want. You try and offer as much as you can, but there are always going to be limitations on what a system can do and government can do. It's wise to remember that because we think government can solve everything, but of course it cannot. Yeah, what helps me to, when I think about residential, is the, the fact that we're talking about that. Um, that we're that we're talking about a person you know, like my stepbrother who lives in a house that my stepmom owns right now, but has 24 seven care, um, wherein, you know, you go back 40 years ago, he's living in, in, a, in a place that's uh, that, that no one would want their loved one to live in uh, back, you know, when, when we look at, you know, what those institutions were like back then. And I'm using that word specifically because that's what they were. And, and the supports when you when you talked about, you know, the early intervention you know, what that looked like and what the terrible choices parents had to make back 40, 50 years ago in early, in order to get early intervention. It's just so powerful. Uh, when you said the word continuum, I was thinking of the timeline of, of where we've come and, you know, I hope it continues to accelerate faster. And I know it has under your watch. You mentioned remote services yes. and that's just, wow. Yes. I'm just floored by that. You know, that's uh, that's where Ohio still stands out. We don't want to get caught, right? As I talk with other directors, they're still calling Ohio to see what, you know, what we call remote supports, what it looks like, and how they can do it. So that's a good thing. But we can, again, we can be better. Uh, and but that's a piece of the puzzle, isn't it? And and there, are, you know, we're still trying to figure out, you know, even after you know the seven or eight years we've been doing this, uh, or more, you know, uh, what are the barriers? You know, and how do we overcome some of those barriers where remote sports might be actually very positive for the person supported, not just for the provider and the lack of staff, but really positive because there's a number of different ways. But the other exciting piece is just the assistive technology, and it's way ahead of me, right? I mean, but, you know, I saw a video the other day of, of, of just what technology can do with respect to communication, how we can adapt homes. I mean, this is just going to be more and more common where we're adapting to the home, to the people that live there. So yes, I might be in a wheelchair, I might have limb, but I can do some basic things if we can adapt the home or I can be more independent, more independent with my husband or wife. I mean, we're just, the world is fundamentally different. It's so much better. So it's exciting to see more and more married couples. It's exciting to see people become more independent on their own. You, you, love, you know all this, technology helps. Technology is essential. Yeah. It's accelerating. We've got to try and stay on top of it, don't we? I mean, to see what all is out there and make sure that we have access to that to the best we can and all these things. But Having met a few people who are on the front lines and design that technology just to, uh, you know, how exciting it is when they see a need and can then fit something to it. I mean, it's just really, really phenomenal. So, you know, people, I mean, we are, an, we are a human system. And we should embrace that. And with that human system comes the way we should treat one another and all those things, of course. But also uh, it is, there, you know, the other side is that sometimes it's really hard to move into the future. You know, I, I you know, change I'm, I'm not fully comfortable with and or, you know, I kind of want to hold on to what I have because I'm afraid of losing that if what I go to, you know, what's next doesn't work. And you just have to hold, you know, we just have to hold each other's hands and, and make progressions where they are and not, you know, and if things don't work the way we are, you either try and improve them or you have, which, you know what, if you're following what I'm saying, it, we just have to be um, as flexible, you know, as loving as we can be uh, and just work through some of these things. And then we'll find that, well, the future is, can be a lot better than we even thought. Yeah, uh, that's great. I'm, I, you know, we're, we're going to end there because I think that, that that really encapsulates everything that I've learned 
uh, and gotten to know about you um, w- through your work with opera. And then that's where I got to know you. And then and then through your work as the director, um, that really encapsulates it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to thank you uh, for for being here today and thank uh, our viewers for tuning in and to make sure that you uh, follow us for uh, more special needs planning information on the special needs planning video cast. No way too Thanks kind. so much. Thanks for inviting me.